Welcome to the Show Me Podcast with your host, Jeff Livingston. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Show Me Podcast. We're in Season 3, Episode 4, and I am uh, really, really excited to uh, do a fine podcast with my friend, Brian Hale. And please forgive me. I'm a little bit tired. I've been waking up early to go do photography every morning the past three days. And I know yeah. Brian does the same thing. So, Brian, how Yeah, you- it's a little different schedule for us guys that roam around at night. I know, man. It's like wake up early, go to bed late. Yeah, it's crazy. So, so first of all, let me set the table and introduce you a little bit. I recently went out to Arches National Park and wanted to photograph a uh, delicate arch under the Milky Way. And, you know, like I'm just not one of these guys that's probably belongs in a desert alone in the middle of the night. And, uh, you know, it's just afraid it's going to get lost or whatever. So I found <laughs> a guide and Brian was that guy. It, I checked out his page, he does a ton of astro and we had a great time. And I'm like, hey, man, I have to have this guy on this podcast so we can talk about astrophotography. So with that, Brian. Well, thanks, Jeff. We sure did have a good time. Yeah, man. The great skies. And like I told you, that was really about the last good night we had here ever since it's been either cloudy, windy, or a lot of light from the moon. So looking forward to this next new moon phase. 100%. And folks can check out both Brian's photo and um, one of the photos I posted from there as well already on our Instagram account. So you can check out our Arches Adventure. And I think that night was actually was unintentional because we were supposed to go out the next night and you reached out to me and said, Jeff, the wind is going to be terrible. It's supposed to be cloudy. If we're going to do this, we should do this now. And I think that's a great way to start our conversation about Astro. It is so crazy contingent on weather, right? It is sure is so much more so than regular landscape. (laughs) Clouds can either hurt you, help you, or totally shut you down. So, yeah, right? Yeah. So, I, and you do a lot of tours, right? And you keep telling me, like, every time I talk to you, it's like, the weather's doing this. I don't know if we're going to have a good tour. Tell, tell me a little <laughs> bit, like, how much uh, it, it matters to what you're doing out there at Moab. Well, uh, a lot of times in landscape photography, the, the weather changes benefit you, a, a storm leaving or coming or creates a dramatic sky. But for astrophotography, it tends to be better for a clear night. And uh, and the weather in the winter is much more clear here than in spring and summer and fall. So those crystal clear nights is what we look for. And, And hopefully in June and July here coming up, it gets a little drier here. We won't have so many clouds and it'll benefit us at night. Yeah, but it gets hot as hell, right? Well, we're out at night. It's the sun out here that gets you. Okay. Really, uh, between, say, 10 o'clock and 5 o'clock in July and August, you don't want to be out in it. So, oh. And one of the things that was funny about where we went, in particular that location, Delta Arch, was, and the trail was so crazy, right? And yeah. Like, so there's a, for folks that haven't been out there, there's a 200 yard uh, ledge (laughs) that you have to walk (laughs) along. So, so maybe talk a little bit about how you prepare to get out there in the desert and shoot, you know, like, you know, flashlights, headgear, all that stuff, right? Well, I think you were smart in choosing the guide your first time up there. The hike up is, is a gentle slope up all the way a mile and a half. But when you turn that corner at Delicate Arch, it's about a you know 200 foot drop off a steep slope, and in the dark, it's tough to find your direction or know your your balance. Sometimes when you pull away from that viewfinder, so you want to be prepared, uh, have that lens on that you're going to use that night, so you don't have to fool around so much up there. Maybe even have your settings already set before you set out on the hike, and so being prepared for a night shot is what I really recommend. And uh, that makes it a lot easier when you turn that corner at Delicate Arch and you see that arch and it's super dark. Yeah. So I know we rarely talk gear on this podcast, but I think probably (laughs) every single person that's interested in this is probably wondering, Yeah. okay, so what's the right gear? 
And um, almost universally, every article you read says get the 14 to 24, 2.8. But you and I shot the that night with like t- between 24 and 35, right? Yeah, yeah. And I know I use a 17, 35. I like that that lens from Nikon. It's a tough lens uh, that I've used for over 20 years. And it's a 2.8 aperture lens. So you always want to use at least a 2.8 aperture. You want to even faster maybe. But our focal length was uh, between 17 and 35, I think around 24. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's a typical range out here in the in arches and in the open desert. You got a lot of space out there. We did that right. Milky Way rise. I shot the one that I posted at 35 and I was looking at the, the stuff that I have. <laughs> Still haven't yeah. processed yet the stack ones, <laughs> but I was looking at them again last night, like, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I shot those at 24. And uh, mm-hmm. so I, I think like one of the things that um, people don't think about when they're considering the Milky Way is, uh, the core, right? Um, and if you right. want to really get into the core and make that pop, you're going to need a, you're going to need more of a traditional wide angle lens rather than super wide or even a standard 50 to get, get right. into that core, you know? Mm-hmm. But uh, e- even with that 35 focal length, I still got the whole arch and plenty of negative space in the landscape. So, you know, br- you know, be ready to, if, if you have two bodies, bring them. But uh, I think that that's pretty cool stuff. Um, now, the other thing you brought, which really added a lot, was the lighting, right? Right. And that's a color adjustable LED light panel. Uh, it's just a small panel, what, uh, eight by 10, something like that. Not even eight by 10, I think, inches. And it puts out plenty of light just to give you that ambient light a little natural look and it's a warmer light if you can get that color adjustable light you see folks out there with flashlights and and other types of lights and they just don't put out the right light it tends to make a red rock look blue or gray yeah in fact the image that i have on here folks go check that out out on instagram i had an led light so the grass on the foreground is blue. And I actually had to desaturate the crap out of that. I literally spent most, you would think most of the editing would be in the star trails themselves, but I took those images and I put them in this program called star stacks and presto that was done. The hard part was the foreground. And another thing about using star stacks, and I know you're going to talk about this a little bit too, stacking those images. You don't have to be real consistent of light across the subject. You could just wave that light. And as you stack the images, it's cumulative. So it tends to average out the lighting. And I think that's what we did that night. I know my stack was about uh, seven images. And uh, then we had a few clouds move in right there at the end. Yeah, we did. And you could see that in the image too, right? On the right. right side. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. Now I bet, um, I bet if I was new, uh, I'd be wondering like, okay, you guys are talking single images, now you're talking stacking, and you know, I, I personally have some opinions about stacking versus single image, and I know there are people who even have star trackers and go that far into it, which is really cool. But t- tell me what your thoughts are on that, and uh, we'll riff a little bit. I think what I use stacking for is when I have the time to do stacking. Uh, If you've got 10 minutes of time there to take up to 15 images, do it. Otherwise, I use the long exposure noise reduction in the Nikon system, which works great. And uh, that is a process in the camera. So you can't stack those images because there's a few seconds after each shutter click that it does a process to clean that file up. But that works great in Nikon. Uh, Comparatively, I guess the stacking is probably better for noise. It does remove quite a bit of the noise in an image. And and there, I figure, I think what I figure where it's a landscape star tracker or something like that. But starry landscape stacker, yeah, starry landscape stacker, and they recommend even putting in a few negative images like if you're like when i did uh 
uh, a stack. I posted, I used 30, 20 second shots, and then I added five completely blacked out 20 second shots from the, with the lens cap on just to create some negative darkness into that. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So Pulls out those, that light image. Right. It's pretty cool. One thing I've noticed about stacking versus the single Milky Way capture, I mean, there are a couple of things. Like, I think the single Milky Way capture, you can have more fun, right? Like, you can have somebody dance in there and, like, hold still <laughs> and light them up. Or, you know, you can do different things like that. But then when you do the stacking, like, the core looks so much better. It's just so much more defined, right? More dimension. You're right. Some people will say it has a three-dimensional look. When you do that stacking, it gives you some more depth. Right. And it's got that, um, the white light around the edge of the core, right? You see that like right. cloud white and you don't right. get that anywhere near as much with the 20 or 30 second exposure. Right. And right. even with the 30 second exposure, right? You start to get the little star trail start to pop, right? Right. Right. A little motion. So it's <laughs> funny. Um, and, and then when I noticed that you do star trails and, Obviously, I do star trails periodically, uh, very rarely. <laughs> um, <laughs> but when you do them, uh, why do you choose to do those? Is it because the Milky Way side up or just because right. you have fun? Or? When we're doing tours, we, we call them night photography tours. So dependent on what the moon phase is, tonight's a full moon. So we would be doing star trails because the Milky Way is not visible. Right. But you in still can bright, get the star trails. In a bright moon situation. So uh, there's a good week around the new moon that we have completely dark skies and a crisp, clear Milky Way on a clear night. Nice. And it's so <laughs> much brighter out there, right? And, yes. Uh, and you've got more parks out there besides Arches, right? you got Canyonlands and you got the local parks. Dead Horse Point, uh, that's another dark sky park. Arches is a dark sky designated park. So the purpose of that is to be conscientious about our dark skies. A lot of people that come here have never seen the, the Milky Way or the amount of stars, satellites, what's going on up in the sky. If you're from a big city, you just don't see those skies. So being designated a dark sky park, we try to keep the lights down in the park as much as possible and uh, just be conscientious about it. How's the uh, light from Moab? which is blowing up, right? I mean, it's, right. it's become quite a destination. How's that impacting that dark sky? Well, as it moves north, the growth of Moab, uh, the lighting from parking lots and buildings, you saw it that night. It's, it's, it's a glow over to the uh, southwest. And so you'll see that in our shots near the horizon. And I hope that it, it, it doesn't grow too much more, but uh, Moab is a growing city and we're seeing that all over the nation. Um, dark skies are dwindling. So the preservation of these dark sky areas, it's a good thing. Yeah. So um, when we go out there, we get some capture. Um, how, do you, how do you go about editing and toning and, you know, what are some of the, the dark Jedi ways? Because I think a lot of people look <laughs> at the image, right? And they're like, okay, so it doesn't look like what I would see on Instagram or wherever. Right. right? Well, when you first pull up your images after you've shot that stack of uh, shots up at Delicate Arch, you probably noticed they were really dark. Uh, so what we do is bring those into Lightroom, all seven, eight, ten, whatever images you've stacked, you want to edit those in Lightroom first a little bit, bring up the uh, the lighting, and 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 then one fell swoop, edit all of them to the same amount, and then blend those in your Starry Landscape Stacker software. Yeah, uh, that's what I. That's how I do it. There's other ways. Some people use Photoshop, but uh, I use Lightroom. Bring it into Starry Landscape Stacker then bring it back into Photoshop. Maybe there's a little dodging and burning we need to do or, yeah. um, or whatever. Get rid but, of the blue light. <laughs> yep. <laughs> One thing that's nice about Starry Landscape Stacker, though, there's 750 or more satellites in the sky these days. Starry Landscape Stacker will take out a moving object in the image. So if oh, you've wow. stacked an image in a satellite that you know, goes across or the Elon Musk train goes across, which I had happen in February, 
voila, it is gone in the final image. And that's a great thing. It's an amazing software algorithm that they have that they can track moving objects. Yeah. It's pretty cool. And uh, I don't know about you. I, I personally, I get into the core itself and I tend to, you know, the, uh, I forget what it's called, the elliptical, uh, I'm so tired. It's not the brush, <laughs> but the elliptical tool in Lightroom. I'll, I'll get in there and oh, create yeah. an inverted mask and then literally kind of get into the core. And I'll, mm -hmm. I'll up my whites, down my blacks, add some crazy toning, you know, give it a little. Yeah. I tend to go magenta for some reason with the uh, Milky Way, but that's just, it's completely editor induced, right? It's not this. Well, sort of if the looks. information is there, I think we yeah. should work with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's amazing how much information these cameras catch, right? Oh, yeah. We're creating smaller pixels, more density, larger megapixel files. So there's a lot more to work with. Uh, the 16 bit depth gives, brought a lot. To the game a few years ago when everybody went from 8 bit to 16 bit that's pretty cool and now how did you get into astrophotography because like I, I think originally you were a wedding photographer if i remember correctly well i'd say originally i was a night photographer i came out here to moab in 1993 and met dan norris and tom till and that's who i'm doing tours with right now these days the last five years that's when uh, I started doing photography seriously and learning long exposure photography. And, and Tom's a legend, right? I mean, like, yeah. Tom is a legend in landscape photography. Yes, he is. <laughs> so how does it feel to work with him? Like this? I mean, like, have, do you he's great to work with and, and we're a team. So we are constantly in communication and finding new spots. We scout out shots. When we do these night photography images, we've typically scouted it out days in advance, sometimes using a compass. And if we each have tours, we communicate and say, hey, this spot's going to be great Tuesday night. You might want to go there for the Milky Way. We've already scouted it out because Milky Way moves from the east in February to the southwest and west in the fall. So it's moving across the sky all throughout the season. Yeah. So, yeah, we work together, and Tom's got some great shots, some great places to go, and uh, we really uh, – and Dan, he is the really guru of night photography. Dan was doing night photography in the early 90s, and the way we did it was with uh, Coleman Lanterns, which put out a great warm light. and Fuji film, it would have been either 50 speed film or 400 speed Provia film. And uh, a couple of times we went to Goblin Valley out west of Moab, which is very, very dark and spooky goblins out in the middle of the desert, lighting yeah. those. And we did star trails. We really didn't do any Milky Way stuff. We, we, we did a lot of star trails in the desert. Yeah, it's funny. I think the star trails are uh, underrated, particularly if you yeah. do, uh, you know, once you start doing them. And I think they're really cool. Uh, I have a, a photo of I've been waiting for a clear sky night to do it uh, here since I got back, which is uh, Manassas Battlefield. I mean, we're, we're not going to get the Milky Way there. It's too much light pollution in the city, but yeah, it's still about 50, 60 miles out. So you get a nice, healthy amount of star trails. And I want to get that Civil War cannon pointed right at the core. Of oh, the, yeah. Uh, Right, like like that, right there, pointing right at that core, dead center, right? You know, it'd be a pretty cool shot, I think. But uh, it's really, it, there's a lot you can do with that stuff and use the uh, the trails as leading lines, even to your landscape subject. So, yeah. so there you go. That's, that's what's called pre-visualization. You've thought this out. You've come up with a designed image before you even take the image. And uh, that's something that goes back in traditional photography to Ansel Adams. Uh, he was a guy that really started the pre-visualization aspect of photography and scoping out shots and going back several times before you really get that image that you've thought out in your mind. It's crazy, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but do you, 
I sometimes just dream of this stuff. Like I'll wake up, I'll have it in my head or I'll be walking around and all of a sudden a shot will pop in my head. And I'll, I'll just keep working at it till I'm there. Right. Or maybe you see a shot in an image that you took weeks before. You may see another shot inside that image and want to go back to that location again. Yeah. So it so pisses me off when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually visualization. <laughs> Yeah, right. I'm actually thrilled uh, uh, with that trip out to Arches. I, I'm looking forward to going back. I want another few turns at it. You know, I just, you know, it was just such a magnificent place. I have a bad feeling about that. Last time that happened to me was in Maine five years ago in Acadia, and I've been back every year since. So, you know, uh, I'd love to go there too. I told you that when you were here. Yeah. Yeah. They got Dark Sky up there as well. It's pretty. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's nice. Um, very cool. So uh, I think we wanted to talk a little bit about landscape, and it seems like we've kind of worked our way into it anyway. But I, I feel like uh, one of the things that people might be picking up on is that landscape, if you're good at landscape, you're going to be a natural transition into nightscape because it's basically the same principles, right? I mean, you're right. Composition is, is, is the same, really, but your subject matter may be in the sky. Yeah, Which and the is lighting. The core nebula, the dark horse nebula of the Milky Way. Yeah, and it's so hard, right? I mean, like, you know, not hard, but it's a different type of image where really you're working with the land on the bottom third, unless you have something crazy like on uh, the balance rock, right? Where it's up in the sky. Right. All that kind of stuff. So, yeah, a lot of times I say in landscape photography, it's 70% sky, 30% landscape. Somewhere in there is a lot of what works well. But for night photography, you might want to lower that down to 20, 25% landscape. You really want to focus on that sky, the Milky Way, or the star trails, or the North Star. Throughout the thirds, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, this has been pretty cool. Is there, uh, let me ask you a crazy question. Is there a shot or five in your, your head that you're dreaming of right now? Well, I do have a shot lined up. I always have something in my back pocket just waiting on the right time of year or maybe the, a, a snowstorm to come through Moab. Uh, but I did notice in a shot that I had from an area here in Cane Creek uh, that there was a whale in the image, in the landscape. The rock formation looks just like a whale swimming through the ocean. So on That's this ridge awesome. here in uh, about July, the Milky Way, is going to be right over top of that whale ridge. Oh, wow. So that's a shot that I'm looking forward to in late June, July, when the Milky Way moves a little bit more south. I bet and if can... we have a nice quarter moon, that's a great time to get out and get the Milky Way before the moon drowns out the stars. So that's a time, a date that we always mark on our calendar is the crescent moon, when the moon is around 20%. That gives just the right amount of ambient light on the landscape. You don't need any artificial lighting on that day. Just oh, a wow. clear sky and a crescent moon and the right angle of the moon. And that's what this location is going to provide. And I hope that Mother Nature cooperates that night. We don't have any clouds. And so look for that shot coming up. I'm looking for it, brother. Whale Ridge. Whale Milky Ridge. way over Whale Ridge. That's awesome. <laughs> so you're going to... You're going to bring that loom cube. So after you get the shot anyway, you might try to light it up in some crazy ocean-like colors. Yeah. <laughs> Why not, right? Uh, there you go. Very cool. All right. Yeah. Well, how, how do people find you, Brian? Well, you can go to the Tom Till Tours website, just tomtilltours.com. And then, as you said, my website, brianhalephotography.com. Uh, has a link to our tours there also, and a whole lot of gallery images, uh, both night and landscape, uh, even some portrait stuff and uh, celebration type shots. Cool. And I know we're going to put your Instagram handle into the uh, story and into the video so people can also follow you there. And if you make it out to Canyonlands, Arches, anywhere out there in Southwest uh, Utah, I highly recommend you contact this guy. Awesome. Look us up. And I'm looking forward to you coming back out here, Jeff. You know it, brother. Thanks for listening to the Show Me Podcast with Jeff Livingston. 
More shows, sponsorship, and donation information are available at showmepodcast.com.